Next stop on our broad overview of the study of ecology is population ecology. This is the study of how and why populations change. Ecologists usually define a population as a group of individuals of a single species that occupy the same general area. These individuals rely on the same resources, they're influenced by the same environmental factors, and they're likely to interact and breed with one another. For example, the red pandas living in central Nepal are a population. When a researcher chooses as a population to study, he or she has to define it with certain boundaries. You need to be clear whether you're studying all red pandas, or all the red pandas in this square mile area, or all of the red pandas in Nepal. All of these could be valid definitions of the word population. Population ecology is concerned with changes in population size and the factors that regulate populations over time. A population ecologist might use statistics such as the number and distribution of individuals to describe a population. Population ecologists also examine population dynamics, the interactions between biotic and abiotic factors that cause the variations in population size that they're monitoring. One important aspect of population dynamics is population growth. To give you an example of what kinds of problems population ecologists might be looking at, let's talk about rabbits in Australia. You may recall from the material on biogeography in our evolution discussion that there are no native placental mammals on Australia. There are some, but they've been introduced slowly but surely over a long period of time. For example, in 1859, a man who was a new resident in Australia decided that he wanted to do some hunting in his free time, and it was just no fun hunting the local fauna. I mean, there's no sport in hunting a koala bear. It just sits there attached to whatever branch you found it on. There's simply no challenge in it. So what he did was he brought 12 pairs, 12 breeding pairs of European hares, European rabbits, uh, and he released them on his ranch. And he figured, okay, so I'll hunt a few uh, every month month, right? Rabbits are famous for being uh, quick breeders, so as I hunt them, they will be able to replace themselves through breeding, and then I will always have a small population of rabbits that I can hunt on my ranch. He was correct that rabbits reproduce very, very quickly, and if anything, he just underestimated their fecundity. Just six years later, 20,000 rabbits were killed on that same ranch. Now, that's not how many rabbits there were on the ranch, that's how many rabbits there were that they eliminated eliminated from the population. The number of rabbits was much, much higher. By 1900, there were several hundred million rabbits distributed across the majority of Australia. The introduction of several hundred million rabbits to Australia devastated the uh, local plant life, the uh, grasses and other kind of herbaceous plants that grow low to the ground, which meant that the native herbivores had much less to eat and their populations declined as a result. In addition, rabbits tend to dig a lot and that caused excess soil erosion and other kinds of environmental problems. When this occurs, when you introduce a species to a new area and their population growth goes way out of hand to the degree that it actually starts damaging the ecosystem, we refer to that as an invasive species. So these rabbits were a new invasive species introduced to Australia. You may remember this term from an earlier slide when I was talking about the main ways in which humans damage the ecosystem. There was habitat destruction, pollution, over-harvesting, and invasive species on that same slide. Species migrating to new areas and trying to look for new ecological niches to exploit is a natural process. However, since humans have been able to connect very distant portions of the globe with uh, air travel and shipping traffic and uh, truck routes and roads and all this kind of thing, the frequency with which new invasive species are introduced to sensitive ecosystems has increased substantially. I'll have lots of more examples of invasive species later on, some of them intentionally introduced, like these rabbits, and some of them accidentally introduced. But we're talking about population ecology right now, so how does 24 rabbits become several hundred million rabbits over the course of 41 years. Once again, I'm going to remind you of some content that we discussed during the evolution section. And that really shouldn't be surprising, because if you recall, populations are the unit of biology that can evolve. Individuals don't evolve, populations evolve. So population ecology and evolution are intrinsically tied together. 
all species create more offspring than are required to replace the parent. And the reason why they have to do that is because not all of the offspring are going to survive to reproductive maturity. And the reasons for this are many. There could be diseases out in the environment that will infect the young. There are predators out in the environment that affect the young. There might not be enough resources for all of the young to be able to get enough food, so they might die. So they might uh, not survive very well because of competition pressure. However, when the rabbits were introduced to Australia, none of these factors that increase their mortality existed. There were no diseases that would infect rabbits and kill them off before they could reproduce. Why would there be? There have never been rabbits on this continent before. There were predators that could maybe pick a few of them off, but the predators didn't have what's called a search image for rabbits. If you just see a completely new food source and you have no idea what it is, your first impulse is probably not to eat as much of it as you can. So it took a while for native predators to kind of catch up and become acclimated to the presence of these rabbits. There was very little competition for the rabbits to worry about because there was an incredibly large amount of space and all of it was filled with grasses and herbs and other kinds of things that rabbits could eat for food. So none of them died from competition pressure either. Australia's winters are also not nearly as bitter cold as Europe's are, so the rabbits basically could breed all year round. In their native habitat, very few rabbits survive to reproductive maturity, so their fecundity, the rate at which they produce new offspring, uh, is an evolutionary adaptation to deal with those selection pressures. But here in Australia, the pressures were gone. There was no force to counteract the number of births that they were having, so their population grew exponentially. On your screen, there is a graph that maps the population size of these rabbits over time. It took approximately seven months for the rabbits to double in population size, to go from 24 rabbits to 48 rabbits. So, time zero, there's 24 rabbits, that's represented by this green rabbit here. But then, at seven months, we had twice as many rabbits. So we had 48, and then another seven months after that, we again doubled the number of rabbits, so we ended up with 96. Seven months after that, double the rabbits, now we have 192. And another seven months after that, we end up with 384 rabbits. So now we're at 28 months, which is two years and four months later, one third of the total elapsed time. And I've run out of space on my chart, but we can put it into the calculator and figure out what this population would look like after the six year period by just continuously hitting times two. Each time we hit times two, we are adding another seven months, so it will take 10.3 cycles before we see what it looks like at the end of six years. Okay, so 24 times two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times, and we're at 25,000. Another seven months, if another seven months had elapsed, we would be at 50,000 rabbits. So that is how you can go from 24 rabbits up to tens of thousands of rabbits within just six years. If we put a trend line on this graph, you'll see that we actually get a J-shaped curve, which indicates that the population is growing faster and faster and faster over time. Any population of organisms, any population at all, that is given ideal conditions, that means no limiting factors such as predators or diseases or space concerns or food scarcity, any population of any species will exhibit this J-shaped curve. And humans are not an exception to that rule. We have an exponential population growth curve. But we will take a moment to specifically talk about human population growth a little bit later. For now, it might be instructive to take a look at what Australia tried to do in order to correct the rabbit situation. They figured, okay, one of the limiting factors that we don't have is predators that are attacking these rabbits. What hunts rabbits back in Europe? Well, European red foxes hunt rabbits. So let's introduce some limiting factors. Let's introduce a predator that will take care of this problem for us. So they got some European red foxes and they released them to go hunt the rabbits. But once the foxes were out there, they said to themselves, hey, you know what's really hard to hunt 
rabbits, and you know what's easy to hunt? Baby ground nesting birds in their nests. So they ended up just eating a lot of small wildlife. That food source was extremely abundant, and they had no native predators, and they had no diseases to contend with, and they could breed all year round. So the foxes also exhibited an exponential growth curve and became their own invasive species. They should have learned their lesson from the little old lady who swallowed the fly. You don't just keep adding more and more animals till you, the problem gets solved. That gets you into a bit of a mess. The theory of evolution by natural selection tells us that the organisms that are the most fit for the environment are the ones that have the most fertile offspring, the ones that contribute the most genes to the next generation. But there's two different strategies that an organism could approach in order to get the highest number of offspring in the next generation. The first strategy is to just have as many offspring as possible, make as many babies as you possibly can. You won't have time to take care of any one of them, so if you uh, use this approach, you need small-bodied organisms with relatively short lifespans. But if you make as many offspring as possible, statistically, at least some of them are going to survive long enough to reproduce. If you have 10,000 offspring, all you really need is one or two to actually survive long enough to pass their genes on to the next generation. An example of an organism that uses this strategy would be a dandelion. Think about all of those little seeds that blow off of a dandelion when they have that kind of nice white fuzz on top of them. Each one of those seeds can become a new dandelion. And dandelions grow in a variety of conditions. They sprout up extremely fast. It does not take them too long to get to the point where they can reproduce. It doesn't matter that dandelions are eaten by every kind of herbivore in this area, or that they're easily cut down by lawnmowers, or that they're pulled up by humans who are weeding their gardens. They make enough offspring that at least some of them will continue to survive and reproduce. Therefore, dandelions are an example of what we call an opportunistic species. Opportunistic species are usually short-lived, uh, they have relatively small bodies, frail construction, you know, they die relatively easily, and they reproduce prodigiously. They have lots and lots and lots of offspring. They take the shotgun approach to evolution. Just scatter as much of yourself around as you can and hope for the best. In this animation, I've modeled the life history of an opportunistic organism. We can assume that every dandelion in this animation has hundreds of offspring, but here I've coded it so that only two of them survive to reproductive maturity. In order to simulate the fact that opportunistic species have a relatively short lifespan, I allow each dandelion to reproduce twice and then die off. That's where their picture disappears. What this hopefully demonstrates is that even if lifespans are relatively short, as long as reproduction is high, you will see an exponential growth curve. Because opportunistic species are small-bodied and short-lived, they don't need many resources in order to survive. Now, as I said, any population that is given no limiting factors whatsoever will reproduce exponentially. What makes opportunistic species special is that they require so few resources in the first place that the environment often seems to have unlimited resources, especially if, say, a forest fire has just cleared off a, a patch of land and there's no competition in that area. The organisms that grow the most quickly and the ones that need the fewest resources and the ones that reach sexual maturity the fastest they are going to get a foothold before any of the other species, and this is why we refer to them as being opportunistic. However, the reality is that resources are always somewhat limited, so that means that there is a maximum number of these organisms that a given ecosystem can hold. We call that maximum number that the ecosystem can sustainably hold year after year after year the carrying capacity. The carrying capacity is the limit of organisms that an ecosystem could hold given the limiting factors that exist at that location. The reproduction of opportunistic species tends to be so fast that these populations overshoot their carrying capacity pretty dramatically. And if you have twice as many organisms in a given area as that ecosystem can hold, well, there's not going to be enough food, there's not going to be enough space, there's not going to be enough nutrients, and not enough sunlight, not enough water, and not enough of any other kind of thing. So suddenly, all of these organisms that are there 
don't have what they need in order to survive, and you get a population crash, bringing them back down to zero. However, since these are opportunistic species, following that population crash, there's basically no competition uh, in that location, and then their population skyrockets again. So we say that opportunistic species tend to reproduce in what are called boom and bust cycles. Exponential growth followed by a population crash, followed by exponential growth, followed by a population crash, followed by exponential growth, so on and so on and so on. We began this video talking about some of the invasive species that have been introduced to Australia, and there are a lot of invasive species that have been introduced to Australia, but let's talk about a few that are in the United States. On the left, we have a red-tailed boa, which is considered a cool pet to have, and people buy them when they're maybe two feet long, and uh, it's great, low maintenance, you just gotta feed them a mouse, uh, you know, once or twice a week, and that takes care of the feeding schedule, so nice pet to have around, they don't make any noise, easy peasy. But then the snake gets a little bit larger and maybe you need to feed it a rat now instead of uh, instead of a mouse and then it gets a little bit larger and you have to start feeding it maybe a rabbit and then maybe at this point in your life you've settled down and you have some kids and you're looking at the size of the rabbit and you're looking at the size of your baby and you're thinking maybe I need to get rid of this snake. So what are you gonna do? As it turns out it's very difficult to get somebody to adopt a six-foot snake at that point. So uh, what a lot of people often end up doing with their exotic pets is they just release them into whatever local environment they happen to live in. It's a snake. Snakes live outside. There's, you know, mice and rabbits out there. It'll do just fine for itself. Now, in a lot of locations, that means that the red-tailed boa is going to die because they are not evolved to deal with a temperate climate, so winter comes through and uh, it's a big problem. But in Florida, on the other hand, in the Everglades, the climate is pretty favorable to these red-tailed boas. So they live pretty well there. They find food, they find ecological niches that weren't being exploited, and they thrive in these environments. And as it turns out, the practice of adopting exotic pets and then releasing them into a non-native habitat is common enough that some red-tailed boas found other red-tailed boas out there in the wild, and they made baby red-tailed boas. This means that there is now a population of red-tailed boas that lives in the Everglades. And this is an apex predator, so they are competing for resources with alligators in that area. These alligators are not accustomed to having competition for their food resources, so their survival is actually decreasing as a result of the competition pressure from these new invasive species. And red-tailed boas get big enough that when a red-tailed boa and an alligator meet each other in the wild, who is lunch and who is uh, the predator really depends on size. This is an important thing to note about invasive species is that you would think that biodiversity increases when you introduce an invasive species, because after all, that's one more species. But because they outcompete natives and they feed on native prey and they eliminate all these other populations, net biodiversity actually decreases after you introduce an invasive species. I mean, they're invasive by definition because they're population growth is causing ecological damage. The center image here is an insect that most of you probably never saw prior to say 2018, but now every summer you can expect to see them absolutely everywhere, and this is the spotted lanternfly. This is a picture of what spotted lanternflies look like when they are nymphs, and a map of the locations where they are found most commonly in Pennsylvania, and you can see that we are pretty close to spotted lanternfly ground zero. The spotted lanternfly uses its piercing mouth part to feed on sap from over 70 different plant species, and it seems to have a strong preference for economically important plants like grapevines and maple trees and black walnut and birch and willow and other trees. It's been estimated by economists at Penn State that they will do about $324 million in damage annually. Another important point about invasive species is they don't just damage the ecosystems, they damage the economy. Once again, I return to my axiom that ecological problems are economic problems and that there are very good selfish reasons to preserve the ecosystem. Finally, I'll finish off this video by talking about purple loosestrife. I want to talk about purple loosestrife because it's an example of biological control of invasive species done correctly. So you remember when the rabbits became a problem, we introduced 
red foxes. That's what we call biological control, introducing one pathogen or predator to deal with another organism that's causing some sort of issue. Biological control has been tried numerous times with many different invasive species. Uh, this wasn't the only example of uh, biological control going wrong in Australia. You can look up stories about cane toads if you are so inclined. And usually it goes poorly because we don't do enough research on the species that we are introducing uh, ahead of time. But in the case of purple loosestrife, we screened hundreds of different insect candidates and tested with all forms of native vegetation to ensure that the only plant that these organisms would eat would be the purple loosestrife. We even tested it against a native relative of purple loosestrife. It was very close in characteristics, and we only selected those insect species that wouldn't attack that one. This is important because if you successfully introduce a predator that starts reducing the population of your invasive species, but as that invasive species disappears, they have to transition to other food resources, that is just going to create another red fox problem, another invasive species showing up. So we wanted to make sure that as the population of purple loosestrife started to go down, the population of these controlled insects also started to go down. So the beetles and weevils, weevils are beetles with mustaches, you can see them on this slide here, uh, that we introduced had to eat purple loosestrife. Their entire life cycle was dependent on this one particular plant, so as that plant disappeared, their populations would also slowly disappear as well. We had one population of insects attack the roots, another one attack the flowers, others attack the stems and the leaves, and this proved incredibly effective. Now, we didn't eliminate purple loosestrife, it's impossible to do that with biological control alone, but we reduced their reproduction rate to the point where other methods of control, cutting and burning and pruning and all this kind of thing were viable methods of removing it from certain wetlands. Now, not all species are opportunistic. Not all species reproduce this rapidly and ignore their limiting factors in the environment. So in the next video, we will talk about limiting factors and we'll talk about what are called equilibrial species.